good God. And he's been turning things around since the beginning of time. Father, we praise you for who you've been, who you are, and who you will always be. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished oh but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens roll Oh, we praise your name Oh, hail King
You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords, and it is only right that our knee would bow. It is only right that our tongue would confess the things that we believe. And Jesus, we believe that you came down as a man, died a sinner's death, and then rose three days later on the cross to give us a chance at salvation, to give us a chance and an opportunity at eternal life with you in heaven one day. Father, we confess these things with our tongue. We bow to our knee and we praise you. We praise your holy name for you are good and deserving of all of the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, that'll get you fired up this morning. Amen, you may be seated. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today and thank you for joining us here at Grace Family Church. My name is Caroline and I have the privilege and honor of serving as your worship lead at the Carrollwood location. Yes, Carrollwood in the house, whoop whoop. Um, you guys are my favorite part of my week. Sundays are my favorite day because I get to spend them with you in God's house and that means so much to me. I love seeing all of our regular faces in the congregation and I love seeing new faces in the congregation as well. Grace, can we give them a nice big warm welcome on the count of three? One, two, three. Amen. We are so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday morning with us because you know we know that you could have been anywhere else. And in fact, if you want to learn more about us here at Grace Family Church, we would love for you to text the word hello to 81313. This will send you some information about our church, about our app, and it will actually send you a coupon for a free item in our cafe this morning. So if you'd like a coffee or a tea, that'll be on us. If you don't want to drink, maybe you want a bakery item like a blueberry muffin or an empathy. Empanada. We have empanadas here at the Carrollwood location, which I think is pretty awesome. So go ahead and text hello to 81313. We would love to get to know you. I don't want to waste any more time because we have another service packed full of some really cool teaching by a man named Brian Osborne is going to be giving the teaching today. So without further ado, let's turn our attention towards the screen for week three of Truth Over Trend. There's a battle between those who build their thinking on God's word and those who build their thinking on man's word. There's a huge difference between God's truth, the truth, and my truth. Did you know that? And you know what we're seeing? We're seeing a culture where we see the collapse of Christian morality and increasing moral relativism because we have generations who no longer believe God's word and they believe it's man that determines truth. Hosea said, my people suffer from a lack of knowledge. I think a lot of people today suffer from a lack of knowledge. God's word is true. It's not just a book of stories. This is the history book of the universe. To reach people today, you've got to focus on the foundation they have. What's your foundation going to be? God's truth or man's truth? Well, amen. Let's go home, right? No, just kidding. So glad you, I'm so glad you're here. So glad I'm here. Uh, my name is Brian Osborne. I'm from Answers in Genesis. You guys doing okay? Everybody good? Oh, man. Uh, it's such a blessing to be here to kind of follow up what Ken has already laid the foundation for in so many different ways. Before we dive into kind of what we're on about tonight, let me introduce my family. They're not here with me tonight, but maybe later on. But here's my, here are my greatest earthly blessings I'm on the screen somewhere. If we can go to the presentation. I'll show you my family. They're much better looking than me. So are they up there? There they are. All right. So yeah, <laughs> I got a lot of pictures of my family. Just hold on. But that's my wife, Marla, of 24 years this past June. I know that seems impossible. She doesn't look that old. We married when we were 12. That's what I'm saying. Uh, 
my daughter Macy, who is four, my son Ian, who is eight. By the way, my son's name is Ian, so when we came to Florida, we brought Ian with us. Yeah, uh, yeah. see what I did there. All right, very good. Uh, I got a ton of pictures of my kids and my family. Just love showing off what God has blessed me with so richly in my life. Uh, and my kids, that's a more realistic picture. Here they are just a bit older. Here's a more recent picture of my kids. I <laughs> love that, so much fun. And we got a recent addition to our family, which I'm sure you're concerned about. We got a dog, the first dog for the kids. His name is Boomer. He's a golden doodle, and the kids are pretty excited about that. And there's Boomer with the kids. Uh, but that's my family. You might see them later on, maybe tomorrow or some other time. Uh, but before joining the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, I was a teacher. I taught Bible history in a public school in Hickson, Tennessee for 13 years. And then joined the Ministry of Answers in Genesis roughly eight years ago. And as you guys already know, our passion as a ministry is to equip Christians to defend their faith where the attack is occurring today. And guys, the passion for defending this faith and giving these answers, it's not just to simply win an argument. We want to give answers. Why? To proclaim the answer, Jesus Christ, effectively to a lost and dying world. That's our passion. That's our heartbeat. And that's the main passion behind today's talk, which is about dinosaurs. Now, aside from the biblical connection of my passion and along those lines, I also love these things personally. Anybody else love dinosaurs in here? And they're awesome creatures, right? I lived on so much. My wife and I, a few years ago, made the first ever snow rex. <laughs> it looks like a white Barney, but we did the best we could with snow, all right? I teach our son Ian to love dinosaurs. He does love these amazing creatures. Actually, recently, he's been drawing quite a lot. He drew that picture. I'm pretty, ah, thanks. I'm pretty impressed, too. He's my son. I'm biased. But anyway, he loves dinosaurs. He's my daughter, Macy, to love dinosaurs. And so we love them in the family. And as a ministry, we love dinosaurs. If you ever get a chance to go to the Creation Museum or the Ark Encounter, for my money, a lot better than Disney, just throwing that out there, all right? But you'll see a lot of dinosaurs as you go through, a lot of replicas, life-size replicas of these amazing creatures, because we do love these amazing creatures. More pictures of my kids with dinosaurs, an animatronic raptor tries to bite you as you go by. We got one of the best allosaurus fossils in the entire world. If you can come near Christmas time to the Ark and the Creation Museum, we light up the botanical gardens. And we have lit up dinosaurs, life-size dinosaurs that are beautiful to look at and huge. Give you an idea of the scale. There you go. That's just by the Spinosaurus. Here's my wife and my mother-in-law about to get eaten by a lit up T-Rex. All right. We love dinosaurs. Lots of people do. And because of that and the nature of our ministry, one of the questions we often get is how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And our answer is simple. The answer is you don't. And people say, well, wait, I thought you believed in dinosaurs. Absolutely, we do. But guys, here's the key. You don't try to squeeze things into God's word. Rather, we start with God's word and use this to explain the world around us, including dinosaurs. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to stand on God's word, use a biblical worldview, use biblical history to summarize these amazing creatures. We're going to look at them from a biblical perspective. And as you do so, you'll see that actually real science confirms the Bible again and again. Because here's what we've got to understand. What the Bible does for us, it gives us the big picture of history to rightly understand things like biology, geology, anthropology, astronomy. The Bible gives us the right understanding of the past that we apply to the evidence in the present. And then we can explain dinosaurs and see that real science confirms a biblical perspective. Because here's a core issue I'm sure Ken and Terry talked about this last week. But ultimately, these issues of the age of the earth and rock layers and fossils, distant starlight, dinosaurs, ultimately, it is a worldview issue. Because hear me, all scientists, biblical and secular, they've all got the same stuff in the present. The same rock layers and the same fossils, the same radioisotopes, all in the present. Here's the key. They interpret those things differently in the present and make different guesses about where those things came from, their origin, and thus their age, rooted in their different starting assumptions about the unseen past, based in their different worldviews. And here's the key. If you start with the wrong assumptions, especially about unseen history, you'll likely get the wrong conclusions. And this is why some really brilliant secular scientists can be so wrong about particular things like the age of the earth and dinosaurs. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Reminded of the story 
of a little boy who was in a doctor's office with his mom waiting in the waiting room. As they were waiting, he looked across the room and saw a very pregnant lady. So he walked to her like little boys do and said, excuse me, miss, but why is your belly so big? He was little, it was okay, all right? <laughs> and she laughed, she said, well, I'm having a baby. And the boy was confused, and the baby's in your tummy? She said, oh yeah. He said, oh, is he a good baby? She said, oh yeah, he's a real good baby. To which the boy responded in horror, well then why did you eat him? That's silly, right? But you get the idea. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Keep that thought in mind as we dive into all these different issues, especially about history, dinosaurs, and so forth. And so as Christians, we are going to stand on God's word and get a biblical perspective on these amazing creatures. So when were dinosaurs made? Day one, two, three, four, five, six of creation week. And the answer is day six. How do we know? Well, because we drew two T-Rexes in this picture, and that proves it. Now, of course, the Bible doesn't explicitly say when God made the T-Rex, but we can figure it out with some basic logic. We all agree T-Rex is a land animal, right? And by the way, by definition, <clears throat> dinosaurs are land animals with a certain hip structure, legs underneath the body. Now, technically, you things like your pterosaurs or sliding reptiles or things like plesiosaurs or swimming reptiles, they're not technically dinosaurs, although we tend to associate them together. But dinosaurs, by definition, are land animals. The Bible says land animals were made on day six, Therefore, T-Rex was created on day six. That's pretty straightforward, right? And of course, we very quickly agree that the Bible is not a science textbook, right? It doesn't give us all the details. For example, it doesn't list all the names of all the animals that God created. And I am glad for that. Could you imagine trying to read through that list as you read through your Bible? Who's made it through Leviticus or Numbers? Be honest here, all right? It can be rough, <laughs> And some would say, okay, but if dinosaurs were made on day six, then why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And it's true, we don't find the word dinosaur in the Bible. If, why? Well, basically, it's a new word. Not invented until 1841 by a guy named Sir Richard Owen. Basically means terrible lizard. It wasn't used that much until the early 1900s. So, of course, we do not expect to find the word dinosaur in older English Bibles. The word was not even invented yet. But there's another word in older English Bibles before evolution became popular that appears to many cases describe various known types of dinosaurs. And that word is dragon, translated from the Hebrew word tanim, repeated numerous times throughout the scriptures. Now, tanim is more broad in its possible definitions, but it includes dinosaurs in those possible definitions. One example, this could be Psalm 74, 13, thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the water. I refer to something like the chronosaurus or the or something like that. But there are also a couple places in the Bible, we'll look at one tonight, where it appears that God may be describing a dinosaur. Go to the book of Job, chapter 40. God tells Job to look at a creature called behemoth, where behemoth just means a monstrous beast. And it's a real creature because God wants Job to look at it, right? And remember the context here, chapter 40, essentially God was putting Job in his place right? Job, see my creative power and know that I am God and trust me, I've got you. No matter what's happening in your life, look at behemoth. And if you've got a study Bible, it might suggest to you that behemoth was maybe a hippo or an elephant. But let's see if that fits the biblical description. Verse 16 says, the behemoth, his strength is in his loins. The power is in the muscles of his belly. So behemoth had a big belly. And of course, we agree elephants fit that part of the description. And so do hippos, and so does any sauropod long-necked dinosaur. But verse 17 becomes really distinctive when it says this, that his behemoth's tail sways like a cedar, like the cedars of Lebanon, like a big tree that sways in the wind. That is what the tail of behemoth looked like. You ever seen the tail of a hippo or an elephant? I don't care who you are, that's not a tree, all right? Maybe a twig, maybe a leaf, not a tree. You take a tree-like tail, you put it on an elephant, it does not fit. Put it on a hippo, also does not fit, all right? You put it on a sauropod dinosaur, a long-necked dinosaur, fits the description really, really well. And friends, at least a nice little side note, and that is this. If your Bible has study notes and footnotes, those things can be handy, but please remember the footnotes in your Bible are not the inspired word of God. The text itself is. And the best commentary on the Bible ultimately is always 
the Bible itself as God's authority. Exactly right. Verse 18 says, his tubes are like bones of bronze, his limbs are like bars of iron. Here's the front leg of a brachiosaurus. Those would be like bars of iron. And that's when he leaned against a replica of a brachiosaurus at the Chicago Field Museum. Those would be like bars of iron. Verse 19 says this, that he is first among the ways of God. Behemoth is the biggest example of God's creative power for Job to see on land. And from all that, all that being said, it appears that God is describing something like this to Job. Job, behold, behemoth, who I made along with you on day six, who feeds on grass like the ox, whose tail sways like a tree in the wind. Now, of course, I got that clip from what movie? Yeah, Jurassic Park. Who's seen Jurassic Park? Bunch of heathens. Okay, very good. <laughs> Kids are like, what's a heathen? Don't worry about it. I'm joking anyway, okay? <laughs> hey, if you do watch those movies, of course, be careful. Lots of violence and bloodshed. Lots of evolutionary dogma. Also, watch out. They're trying to convince you a false, a false idea. But they're trying to convince you that some dinosaurs evolved into birds, a subtle theme all the way through. Very popular in evolutionary thinking, but not in reality. But then moving on, we have flying reptiles, flying serpents, possible dragons, so-called, mentioned in multiple places in God's word. The flying fiery serpents, probably tear swords of some variation. We could keep going. And someone would say, okay, Brian, but wait, if dinosaurs lived with man, like, then what did they eat? Especially like the T-Rex. Like, wouldn't Adam get worried when lunchtime rolled around? It's a good question. It's a fair question. And there's a good biblical answer. So we go to the Bible, and let's phrase the question this way. What did the T-Rex originally eat? Was it A, B, C, or D? What's the answer? Uh, everybody's scared, right? I understand. I get it. The right answer is A. And for those who are wondering, but wait a minute, how do you know that? It's that great Sunday school answer. The Bible tells us so. Go to Genesis 129. In the original perfect creation, God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit. The animals were to eat plants. Originally, all things were vegetarian. And I know that sounds weird to us today, but it makes really good biblical sense. Because think about it. There was no death in this world until after Adam sinned, which means you can't eat meat until after Adam sinned. Because when we eat meat, we're eating an animal that has died. Before sin, there's no death. All things have to be vegetarian. Makes really good biblical sense. And so even things like the T-Rex before the fall of man, that's key, before the fall of man, ate things like fruits and vegetables, pineapples and coconuts. And some would say, okay, Brian, but wait. Are you saying the T-Rex with those six inch serrated fangs ate things like fruits and vegetables, pineapples and coconuts? Absolutely. If you're trying to bite into a coconut, that's a bad idea, right? That's like a redneck's famous last word. Hey, y'all watch this. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? I'm from North Carolina. That's my people. Okay, I can say that. It's okay. No. We get a knife to cut into a coconut, right? The T-Rex was just pre-equipped to get into things with hard shells, to get to nutrition on the inside in this pre-fall world. And plus, bear in mind, if you find the fossil of a creature and it's got big, long, sharp teeth, all you know for sure about that creature is that it had big, long, sharp teeth. There are lots of creatures today in our Genesis 3 fallen, sin-cursed, messed-up world that have big, long, sharp teeth that are primarily or only vegetarian. A couple examples of those. Look at this primate from South America. Look at those teeth. You know, he was picked on in school. Primarily vegetarian. Oh, how sensitive is that? Okay, very good. But look at that skull. Look at those teeth. That must be a vicious meat eater, right? Well, that skull belongs to a fruit bat. And as you might guess, a fruit bat eats... Well, they do. Well, look at that skull. Look at those menacing teeth. That's a meat eater, right? That skull belongs to the vicious, horrible bamboo murderer. <laughs> and then one last one for the sake of time. Look at these saber-tooth-like teeth. Belongs to something called the Chinese water deer. It's a real creature. It's really round, uh, really freaky looking, but it's also really vegetarian. And we could just go on with this, but here's the point. Especially in the original Very Good Creation Adam and Eve, they could hang out with the lions or the tigers or the bears. Oh my, anybody, nobody? Old reference, all right. You could bring a T-Rex home as a pet. <laughs> That'd be so cool, but you know what? That's the way it was and that's not the way it is. What happened that changed everything? A three-lettered word called sin changed everything. 
the second C of our seven C's of corruption, Adam's sin, bringing death and suffering into this world. And by the way, this real history is fundamental to answering one of humanity's most fundamental questions. And that is this, if there's an all good, all knowing, all powerful God, why did he make the world full of so much death and suffering and bloodshed and disease and hurricanes and so forth? The answer is he didn't. Guys, God gave us what he wanted for us. He gave us perfection. Who wrecked this world? We did in our sin. We wrecked God's perfect creation. And guys, God's provi- God provides a bridge of salvation for us even after we wrecked his perfect creation. There's a short answer, but a powerful answer to that particular question. But man's sin brought death, the enemy, and the curse and bloodshed into God's creation. Romans 8, 22 puts it like this, that the whole of creation is groaning in pain. Why? Because of man's sin. And it's longing for when Christ returns, hail the king, amen? It returns the world to its original perfect state. And by the way, as I'm sure Ken and Terry talked about last week, this is why you cannot consistently squeeze the secular atheistic idea of millions of years into the Bible. If you try to squeeze it into the Bible, no matter how you try, inevitably you'll put death before sin. And death before sin is theologically impossible. You see, if there was death before sin, that would, be, that would mean man's sin had no effect on creation. That's just always been around, part of God's very good creation. And that would mean death is not the consequence for sin. And if death is not the consequence or payment for sin, then Jesus' death cannot and does not pay our sin debt. And you just undermine the gospel, whether you meant to or not. And that's why, dear friends, we're so passionate about this issue. I tell people all the time, my passion is not winning a debate about the age of the earth. I like giving answers about that. I do to point back to the truthfulness of God's word. My passion is the gospel and the authority of God's word in which the gospel is rooted. That's what's under attack. That's what's at stake. That's why it matters so much. Because bottom line, the good news of Jesus Christ doesn't start in the book of Matthew. It starts in the book of Genesis. It truly does. But not until after man sinned that the diet for many dinosaurs, animals changed. Not until after the flood that God told Noah just as I gave you plants to eat, now, Noah, you can eat everything. And by the way, this is the biblical reason you can eat a hot dog, because a hot dog is everything. <laughs> by the way, that's totally, that's, that's Ken's joke. Did you tell it last week? No, okay, good, very good. If he sees this, he might pick on me. But anyway, it's still funny, all right? Also, not until after the flood that God told Noah, I'm putting the fear and dread of the animals into the beast of the earth. So post-flood, animals are scared of people. Keep that in mind for later on. And someone will say, okay, Brian, well, that seems to all make sense. So dinosaurs with man, uh, then the world got corrupted, man sinned, God sent the flood. So maybe God let all the dinosaurs die during the flood. It's a good thought, but is that what the Bible teaches? And the short answer is no. Genesis 7.15 says this, that God brought to Noah pairs of all the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. Dinosaurs are land-dwelling and air-breathing. That means God brought to Noah pairs of dinosaurs as well. And someone will say, but how can Noah get dinosaurs on the ark? As a matter of fact, how can Noah get all those millions of animals on the ark? We'll answer the bigger question and talk about dinosaurs as we do that. First, how did Noah get all those animals onto the ark? Well, first, we've got to understand Noah's ark did not look like that, praise God, all right? It was a real ship come to northern Kentucky to the ark encounter to see a life-size replica of it. Over 500 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet tall with three different levels. It exhibits all the way through at the Ark Encounter. This thing was huge. Capacity equal to roughly 500 semi-trailers. That's a floating warehouse. But was it big enough? How many animals did Noah take? Well, the Bible's clear. God brought to Noah only the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. There were no sea creatures. There were no fish on the Ark. There was plenty of water outside the boat for them, Right? And also, for many good practical reasons, we'll return to this in a moment, God brought to know most likely young adults or many creatures. And then maybe the biggest issue all of all is this. God brought to know two of each kind. Not two of each species, two of each kind. And the word kind in the Bible, for the most part, it's equal to about the family level of modern-day classification. And what that means practically is this. Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. He most likely never saw Chihuahua or Poodle in his life. He was a blessed man. I got a golden doodle now. Can I even make that joke anymore? I don't know. But uh, 
No, he brought two of the dog kind and two of the elephant kind and two of the cat kind, just two of the basic kinds of animals. And there's a similar thing with dinosaurs. I mean, some would say there are hundreds or thousands of variations of dinosaurs, right? Well, just like with dogs, lots of variation, but the one kind and horses and cats, similar with dinosaurs. There are lots of variations of the ceratopsia kind, but just the one kind. There are lots of variations of the sauropod kind, but probably just the one major kind. There are around 60 to at most 80-something dinosaur kinds. Multiplied by two, not that many needed on the ark. And so someone would say, okay, not that many needed, but are you serious right now? <laughs> like, wouldn't one be too much? That's a good question, but also it's a very typical misunderstanding about this, and that is the average size of a dinosaur was equal to that of a bison, like a big cow. And some were as small as chickens. It's true. Now, if they were still around today, we could eat some good old KFD. <laughs> and of course, it would taste like what? Chicken. It'd have to. Exactly right. I'm from Kentucky. I must say that joke now. But anyway, but as it turns out, we know that all dinosaurs started off small. You said, you know, all of them. Well, because they hatched from eggs. And the biggest neck can get is about the size of a football. Because the bigger that gets, the thicker the shell's got to be to support its own weight. But the shell can't get too thick because then oxygen can't get through to keep the creature alive. So max size for an egg is about that big. So when you find a T-Rex egg or Stegosaurus egg, it's no bigger than this. Same thing with these sauropod dinosaurs. And that's really not that weird because you guys in Florida know this. When alligators or crocodiles hatch from their eggs, you can hold them in the palm of your hand. Give them a few years, and if you're not careful, they can hold you in the bottom of their belly, all right? And plus, remember, God brought the animals to Noah. So we're going to bet God's got it figured out. You don't have to bring the biggest ones. And we're going to bet God brought young adults to Noah for many good practical reasons. You bring young adults because they're smaller, they tend to weigh less, eat less, sleep more, they're tougher in particular ways. And then number six there is really important. Young adults will live longer after the flood to produce more offspring to refill the earth post-flood. That is the whole reason you're taking them to begin with. Lots of reasons to take those young adults. So that's why when you come to the Ark Encounter, you see amazing exhibits like these, of these juvenile dinosaurs, these sculptures. By the way, all of this stuff is done by our in-house artists. They are so gifted. By the way, if you're gifted like this, you want to apply this for God's glory in our ministry, come on, we need you, all right? I love this picture. See the kid in the corner there? I love that picture. Uh, but yeah, they would feel no problem as juveniles, as youngins on that massive boat, according to their kinds. How many were there? How many total kinds did Noah need to account for all variations we see today and in the fossil record? Guys, in a worst case scenario, he needed no more than 1,400 total kinds. Multiplied by two, seven or 14 of the clean. In a worst case scenario, he needed no more than 7,000 individual animals on that massive boat. And by the way, tomorrow night, we'll talk more about Noah's Ark and flood adventures in regard to that and geology, and paleontology, and so forth. But once they're on the Ark, the Bible says, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heaven were opened. And literally, the flood rearranged the surface of this globe and wrecked this world. And because of that flood, we expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And that is exactly what we find. Tremendous confirmation of the Bible's historicity. Again, come back tomorrow night for more on that. And someone say, okay, but if dinosaurs lived and died, many of them not that long ago, then shouldn't there be a lot of, you know, forensic, touchable evidence they lived not that long ago? And oh my goodness, there is so much. We do a whole lecture just on that. A few quick examples for the sake of time. We are now finding literally all over the globe and pretty much all the rock layers with dinosaurs in them, we're finding soft tissue from dinosaurs still intact in their bones. You say, what do you mean by soft? I mean, it's still literally stretchy and pliable. Stretch it'll spring back in place. Oftentimes there are blood vessels and red blood cells still intact in that tissue. Like in this Triceratops remnant, or this duckbill dinosaur one, or this T-Rex one. I could go on and on. There've been so many finds like this. And these organic remnants, like our flesh, they're made of mostly water. And hear me, they should not last hundreds of years after the creature's death. Maybe thousands in special conditions, like a, after a flood. No way, millions. Great confirmation of the biblical time scale. And some will say, okay, well then, when people find stuff like that, that's got to be a slam dunk. That must convince the evolutionists that they're wrong about the time frame, right? Wrong. Not necessarily. You see, all this stuff, ultimately, it's not a head issue. It is a 
heart issue that becomes a worldview issue as a result. And your worldview, watch this, tells you how to interpret what you're looking at to fit your preconceived ideas. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. I'll give you a great example of this. I'm gonna show you a clip of this lady named Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Uh, she found this particular sample that you just saw, the T-Rex tissue. And I'm sure she's a very sweet lady, a brilliant lady, especially in her field. But I want you to see as she looks at this evidence, I want you to hear her reaction. And as you do, bear in mind, brilliant woman, what this clip shows is the power of your worldview to lead you astray. Check it out. I'm not going to believe this. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproinged and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels, and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it, that's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump-inducing scientific moments, that's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Did you catch that? Don't rethink the age. Here's what she basically said. There must be some chemical process that we have never, ever observed that is somehow making these things last for billions of years. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. The Bible offers a much better, clearer explanation. Why do we find all this soft tissue right answer? Many of those dinosaurs died not that long ago during Noah's flood. Now, of course, some dinosaurs were on the ark and got off the ark and lived with man post-flood. That being the case, there should be historical documentation of man with dinosaurs. And there is. But remember, the word dinosaur is a new word. Before 1841, these creatures were called something else. They were called, for the most part, dragons. And these legends are literally all over the globe and pretty much every single culture around the world. And even the honest evolutionist knows this. What's this clip from the Discovery Channel talking about this? There is one creature remembered in the legends of almost every human culture that's ever existed. A creature depicted with remarkable similarity by the Chinese, the Aztecs, even the Inuit who live in a frozen land where no reptiles are found. Even they have stories of this animal, the dragon. Cultures from different continents People who had no contact with one another, yet all of them have stories describing the same mythical animal. Could it be these stories were more than myth? What if we discovered that this creature that haunts our imagination had once been real? Now, of course, they try to explain away those legends with, with the evolutionary worldview, but the point is they acknowledge them. And yet some of them have been embellished over time, but many of them accurately describe various known types of dinosaurs. A couple quick examples of this. According to the Encyclopedia, World Book Encyclopedia, back in 1973, it said, dragons and legends are strangely like actual creatures that lived in the past. They are much like the great reptiles, dinosaurs. Every country has them in its mythology. By the way, speaking of things that go extinct, who remembers encyclopedias? <laughs> Throwing that out there, all right. Or legends like this, St. George is said to have killed a dragon around 275 A.D., the description of the dragon that he slew fits of a dinosaur known as Baryonyx and found bones in that same region where this supposedly took place. A city in France that describes a dragon that was bigger than an ox with great horns on its head. The city was, in name, was renamed in honor of that particular dragon by a triceratops of some variation. Marco Polo, the man, not the pool game, reported that the emperor in China back in 1271 AD, he used dragons to pull his chariots in his parades. Which, let me just say, if I were an emperor and there were dragons around, they would pull my chariots too, because that is awesome. <laughs> Here you are, right? Well-known historians like Aristotle and Herodotus, they reported seeing these flying dragons. 
Or when I just saw these winged serpents as they flew for Egypt and he described them as being like snakes and having membranous wings like a bat. The story Animalia said dragons were still around in the 1500s, but were rare by then and fairly small in comparison to older dragons. And then all around the globe, we find these carvings and drawings that appear to show man with dinosaurs. Here's a piece of ancient Egyptian pottery. Seems to show two long-necked dinosaurs. Here's a Roman mosaic from the second century AD. Again, seems to show two long-necked dinosaurs. Or go to northern England, visit Carlisle Cathedral, see the tomb of Bishop Bell, who died about 500 years ago. There are brass strips around that tomb with carvings of animals on those strips. Some of those carvings look like known types of dinosaurs. Or this temple built in Cambodia about 1,000 years ago. Zoom in on the column of this temple. Seems to clearly depict a stegosaurus. Or coming back close home over in Utah, here's a petroglyph that clearly shows a sauropod dinosaur. Got the long tail, four legs, long neck, and then the head. Down the road from there, different petroglyphs showing a pterosaur, some variation it appears. Another cave wall drawing, enhanced for you, but this is accurate, showing a sauropod dinosaur. Here's one from the Aboriginal people of a creature they call Yaru. And they said Yaru was real. If you look really close in the belly of Yaru, you can see their friend. He ate their friend. They're trying to get their friend back. All right, but Yaru looks a lot like a plesiosaur. We could just go on and on. These legends are literally everywhere. And if you want some entertaining reading, just listen to the evolutionists try to explain away those legends within their worldview because it doesn't make sense within their narrative how we have all these legends that sound like dinosaurs were people. It doesn't make sense in the evolutionary worldview. But then that leads to this last big question. People say, okay, Brian, all that makes sense, but then here's the big one. What happened to them? This is where the talk does get really deep. Here's the answer. They died. <laughs> People are like, okay, smart aleck, we know that. Why did they die? And we can make some good biblical educated guesses as to why they went extinct. We'll do that here in a moment. But before we do so, we'll look at some of the evolutionary guesses because those are pretty educational and entertaining to some degree. Of course, it's very popular today. Most evolutionists would argue that some dinosaurs evolved into birds. That's what happened to them. They evolved into birds. So the next time you go to Chick-fil-A to eat some sanctified chicken, you're technically eating a dinosaur based on evolutionary ideology. But friends, this is biologically, genetically, scientifically impossible. If you're gonna change a dinosaur into a bird, you have to add brand new genetic information over time. And guys, natural selection and mutations, which are real things, here's what they do. They duplicate, shuffle, or lose existing genetic information. They do not add it. Genetically, biologically, biblically, scientifically impossible. Of course, it's very popular to say that maybe a meteorite or asteroid hit the earth and killed all the dinosaurs, big and small, but somehow left many other creatures alive. It's kind of a cool trick. Some think dinosaurs died of indigestion, which would be painful. Some have suggested, this is a real theory, that dinosaurs may have gassed themselves into extinction. And it means what you think it means. <laughs> they start eating the wrong sort of plants, got really upset stomachs, released too much gas, released too much methane into the atmosphere, caused the greenhouse effect to increase the temperature of the earth, and the dinosaurs could not stand the heat. So many, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Someone said that stinks. <laughs> there are a lot of bad jokes that could go right there. Uh, I always just simply say, that would be the worst kind of climate change. Amen, I just leave it at that, because it does stink. All right. Some think they overate, some say they underate, something they started to death, something a natural catastrophe, some variation killed them off. I've got one theory of my own. This is my own theory. Maybe this is what happened to the dinosaurs. Makes sense to me when you think about it. <laughs> Chuck Norris has been around for millions of years. <laughs> Just joking, right? But what really happened to them? I think we can make some good biblical educated guesses as to at least two big probable problems they faced post-flood. Here's going to be the first, and that is climate change. Now, don't, don't get confused here. We're not talking about the idea of man-caused climate change. We're talking about real God-caused climate change. Go to Genesis 6, verse 13. God told Noah this, I will destroy both them and the earth. Part of the purpose of the flood was to wreck this world. And we likely live in a broken, wasted junkyard compared to what it used to be pre-flood. If you look in the Bible, it's interesting. Before the flood, people lived on average over 900 years, which what do you do for that long of a time? 
I don't know, all right? But that's pretty incredible. And most cultures have legends of that, actually. But after the flood, that lifespan drops off really quickly to what we see today. Why the rapid decline post-flood? Well, genetic bottleneck is probably the big mover and shaker in this, maybe the primary role that leads to this. But also it's safe to assume that God accomplished his purpose of wrecking this world. It was a broken climate, a broken environment post-flood. Things don't live as long or grow as big post-flood. See a rapid drop off there. Also, after the flood, is the perfect time for an ice age? Talk about that tomorrow night. Most likely bad for dinosaurs. Lots of things related to climate that most likely were very bad for them pretty quickly post-flood. So that's probably one big problem. Second one's going to be this, and that is people will likely hunt them intensely post-flood. You say, people hunt dinosaurs? Remember earlier we mentioned that God told Noah after the flood, I'm putting the fear of man into the beasts of the earth. So after the flood, animals are now scared of people, which means either they typically run away from you or they attack and so as people disperse post-flood and start running into dinosaurs, they become a threat. You got to hunt them to protect your families. They need to win a trophy, different sorts of things. You know, dinosaurs for lots of reasons. For meat, because they're a menace to be the hero, the sure superior, competition for land, so forth and so on. And by the way, those are the same reasons animals go extinct today. Extinction is the rule of thumb, not the exception in our fallen world. You see, when we think about all this stuff biblically, I love this. Dinosaurs are not a mystery if you'll start with the Bible. They're awesome, not a mystery if you'll have a biblical worldview. And we actually call these creatures missionary lizards. <laughs> you say, why? Two big reasons. Here's the first. When you properly understand dinosaurs, it shows the world, and dare I say much of, a, much of the church, such an important, relevant truth they need to hear. And that is this. You can trust this book the Bible. It's right about everything. It's right about history and dinosaurs. It's right about morality, gender, and sexuality. It's right about salvation found in Christ alone. Why? Because this book is the very word of the living God, and God gets everything right. Amen. And then the second reason we call them missionary lizards is this, because as we talk about dinosaurs, we're reminded of death. Well, why? Because they're dead. And why do things die? A three-lettered word called, you guys know, right for the wages of sin is, the Bible says this, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Did you realize this, that every false religion, everything other than biblical Christianity has one basic narrative, that is this, you can save yourself. Do enough good deeds, appease your gods or your God or yourself, your atheist or your own God, appease the force, do enough good stuff. You can earn your own version of salvation. Guys, only the Bible tells you the truth, which is this. Hear me, you can never earn your own salvation. Why? Because God's standard, rightly so, is perfection. Because he is perfect in holiness and righteousness. You want to go to heaven based on your own work, you'd have to be perfect. That means you have to obey all God's laws perfectly from womb to tomb. And then news gets worse before it gets better because God's omniscient. He knows your thoughts and your motives. Those must be perfect as well. See, the Bible says this, whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point is guilty of breaking it all. And Isaiah says this, that even our righteous acts are like filthy rags before a holy God because they're rooted in our sin and our pride in our attempt to bribe God. Guys, we are utterly helpless in and of ourselves. That's the bad news that starts in Genesis. But that's why the good news is the best news. That while we were still sinners in glad rebellion against our creator, Christ died for us. That if you will repent of your sin, turn away from your sin, confess through the mouth of the Lord Jesus, he's God and king and you're not. Believe your heart, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And it must be Christ. Why? Because he is God who became flesh. He lived the perfect life we can never live. He died on the cross in our place as the perfect, infinite sacrifice we could never be. He rose from the grave defeating death. He's accomplished all that we never could. Put your faith in him. He alone is your way of salvation. And really, friends, we wrap up tonight as I'm flying through this, right? But I wrap up with the gospel for two reasons. Number one, if you're here tonight, if you're watching online, if you are seeing this, and you just heard the gospel maybe for the first time or maybe you're hearing it again and God's drawing you in right now, can I implore you right now, let today be the day of salvation for you. Turn to Christ because you're not promised another breath. You're not owed another breath. Every breath you take is God's mercy on your soul. And if you're a Christian here tonight, dear Christian, please notice what we just did. We went from dinosaurs 
to the gospel. We did apologetics. We defended the faith to get to the answer, Jesus Christ, because that's what this is always about. Apologetics is not about winning debates and arguments. It's giving answers to proclaim the answer, Jesus Christ. And our passion is to equip you to do this through our ministry. You can go to our website, answersingenesis.org. See tons of free resources there. There's a QR code you can access later on for a special deal within this conference. And be sure to check that out. But get equipped to stand on God's word, defend the faith, and proclaim the good news of Christ effectively to this lost and dying world. Amen? Amen. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for the truth of your word and that we can trust your word in everything that it says. Lord, may we love you and love your word. May we love the lost boldly, lovingly, uncompromisingly proclaim your truth that your spirit and your word may go forth and change hearts and lives for your glory. God, we love you and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name, name. amen. I hand it off to your campus pastors. Amen. Wasn't that good? Man, look at you guys. That's a lot of information. But I tell you what, we're in a culture that we need to be equipped. Amen. And we're going to continue that conversation tonight at 6 p.m. at the Lutz campus. We have no child care, but there's another workshop. And Brian is going to talk a little bit more on Noah's Ark and the flood with more detail. That's tonight at 6. We would love to see you there. You know, we get a chance to do these these speakers to come in and share some great equipping tools for us, some some great resources, and we can't do this without you. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. This is when we receive our tithes and offerings, and man, the church is really being equipped in such an amazing way that's reaching people outside of these walls. So thank you for your faithfulness. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that the blessings you've given us, we get to be a blessing to other people. Thank you that your word is traveling outside of these walls. Thank you for equipping us to share the good news of Jesus to the entire world. May you bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And with that, investing in the next generation, I got Miss Karina Lima with me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, guys, I have the honor of leading our youth here at this amazing campus. And every Wednesday night, our middle school all the way up to our seniors in high school meet here at this campus for youth group. And this past month, we've been in a really cool series. We've actually been doing our own apologetic series called Valid. And this Wednesday night, we have a special Q&A workshop that's going to be actually led by Brian Osborne. And it's going to be hosted. I guess that's exciting. It's going to be hosted at our Lutz campus, but we are live streaming it here at this campus. And I want to give a special invite to all of you in this room to come and join us. Okay. Our doors open at 630, but here's why I want you to be a part of this. I would love for everyone in this room to see what we do here at GFC for our students, to see the real things that we talk about and actually hear from our students, the questions that they have, and they're ready to have answers for. So again, that's this. Wednesday. Doors open at 6 30. Yes, there is a hurricane that's on the radar. So of course, if we have to close our doors and cancel that, we will let you guys know through social media. So make sure you're following us on all of our social media platforms. Amen. I know raising three teenagers, man, they had a lot of questions growing up. And I know if you have teenagers, you want to bring them to these environments, especially Wednesday night. But guys, I have another event I want to highlight called Man Event. Where my men at? Yes, man events coming up. Let's watch this together. Oh, yeah. Hey guys, we want to talk to all the men out there. You know, sometimes we're going along in life and we get a little distracted and maybe even feel a little isolated. And I know we've lived life long enough to know that it's hard to do life alone. Yeah, it's not fun. It's not only should you connect with other people, we need to connect with other guys. We need a group of guys that can support you, encourage you, and do life with you. The hard thing is, where do you start? Yeah. Man Event is a two-day conference that you can invite people, you can build community, and really the most important part of what we're doing here, you can build a deeper relationship with Jesus. Not only that, we're going to have fun, yes, we are. food, activities, challenging messages, and mm. guys like us, we're going to be there. So this is an opportunity for you to grow together and invite somebody as well. Many of the men at Grace have found their community at Man Event, and we are encouraging you. We're challenging you. You know, if you invite a friend, you build community, and you connect with God, you're going to realize in life, you got this. 
Woo, come on, man. Yeah. October 14 and 15. I love what he said. Invite a friend and do life together. It's so important as we do this faith journey with Jesus. He wants us to be in community. And that's Man Event, October 14 and 15. You can text MAN to 81313 and register. And I heard that if you register today, you get a free t-shirt. So guys, get on it. Bring a friend. Register a friend. You can do that on your app as well. Also, guys, we have an event that we, it's not a Grace Family tradition, right? Water of baptism is a command from God himself that as you have made a decision to follow Jesus, you also follow him in water of baptism. You know, we're doing it outside in the lobby. We did an uh, uh, amazing family, got water baptized in the first service, and we have them right now. I'll be in the pool with you. But we have shorts, we have towels, we have T-shirts. If you want to take your next step, which is after salvation, after saying yes to Jesus, your next step is to believe and be water baptized. I love you guys. I want to pray over this storm that Karina was mentioning. I know a lot of us, you know, we're hearing the news. We can be gripped with fear. But I tell you what, God says that when you pray, something happens to you. And that's you get his peace. Amen. So we're going to pray. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come up. Yes, you can clap for that. Prayer team, please come up. Let's ask God to intervene in this storm because these storms ain't nothing for God, right? Father, we thank you, Lord. Father, we, we come against any fears, any anxiety, anything that's stressing us, Lord, because of this storm. Father, you rebuke the storm in Jesus' name. You've given us, Lord, the power of prayer. Prayer works, and we're coming to you, God, that you would bless this church, that you would bless us, Lord, financially. You would bless our relationships. You would bless our comings and our goings. So, Father, we pray for health, God. We pray that you would continually... Minister to us. Equip us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. I will see you in your groups. Hope I see you guys Wednesday night.